Welcome everybody to the 2016 Yale CNC Academy's Conversations with Scientists. Um, today we have a very interesting conversation about um, how to secure a postdoc. And with us today we have two uh, postdoctoral fellows and two young faculty members who are going to be sharing their experiences about uh, uh, um, looking and securing a postdoc. Um, we'll get started in a minute, but I first wanted to give some housekeeping. Um, please make sure to mute your lines when you're not speaking. I think we're all indoctrinated in that by now. Um, but also please remember to unmute it when you want to speak, um, because otherwise we just see, you know, moving lips. Um, for our fellows, um, I will be moderating the panel, which means that I will introduce the speakers, make the first question, um, but of course, you know, this is, is your conversation. So after that, you know, you guys um, should take over with your own questions. Um, we shared the questions you already prepared with the panelists, so they already have an idea of what you guys want to talk about. Um, if you have a question for our speakers, you know, please use the raising of the hand function um, on Zoom. Um, or you can also make a question on, or a comment in the chat section. Monica is the one that's going to be choosing um, the questions and calling on you. Um, so she's going to be um, leading us with that. Okay. Um, all right. So let's get started. Um, we have with us today uh, Dr. Samuel Diaz Muñoz, who is a postdoctoral fellow in the Center for Genomics and Systems Biology of New York University. Um, Samuel has a very diverse scientific background. It has taken him from studying the ecology, evolution, and genetics of uh, tamarind monkeys in Panama to the social interactions of microbes. Um, so a big, big gamut there. He uses, currently he's using experimental viral genomics to understand the causes and mechanisms of virus-to-virus uh, -virus interactions and viral genetic exchange. Um, hola, Samuel. Hola. Hi, everyone. <laughs> no te escuchamos. Hola. Hi, everyone. Uh, no. no. Yo, yo lo oigo. Yeah, we can hear you. ¿Lo escuchan? Sí. Sí, yo lo oigo. Okay. Okay. Sí, lo um, we also have Paola Justi Rodriguez, who's a postdoctoral fellow at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, um, where she uses functional genomics and genetics to uh, gain insight into schizophrenia and other psychiatric disorders. Um, Paola was recently awarded a Mentor Research Scientist Development Award, a KO1, by the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, so, hola Paola, ¿cómo estás? Hola a todos. Todo bien. Chévere. We have Alberto Cruz Martín. Um, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Biology at Boston University. And um, he's a neuroscience that has, a neuroscientist that has extensive experience in microscopy and electrophysiology. And currently his work focuses on visual processing and perception. Uh, Alberto is also specifically interested in bridging the gap between what we know about how neurons work at the cell level and how networks and systems work to produce sensation and perception. Bienvenido, Alberto. Saludos. Muy bien. Uh, we also have, finally, um, Kaliri Salas Ramirez. Um, Dr. Salas Ramirez is an assistant medical professor at the Sophie Davis School for Biomedical Education. Um, the Cooney School of Medicine in Harlem. She teaches clinical neuroscience and focuses on increasing the number of underrepresented minorities who are primary care physicians, which is a very important mission. Um, she also holds an adjunct assistant professor position at the Department of Psychology in Hunter College, Cooney. Um, and Kaliris has spent uh, significant time through her career studying how cocaine affects the brain during development and she's also recently become interested in how different cancer treatments affect cognitive behavior. Hola, Kaliris, ¿cómo está? Hello, everybody. Perfect. Um, okay, so um, one question that most of you 
guys have that I think is very good to open the discussion with um, has to do with um, that very early uh, central decision of why did you, why, why does one decide to do a postdoc? Um, so we want to ask our panelists to answer the question, why did you decide to do a postdoc? Um, was it something that you all knew always that you were going to do, or you always directed um, and, and that you knew that you were going to do a po an academic postdocs? What kind of considerations went, went into that? Um, and let's start with uh, Samuel. Hi, so uh, for me, my career, career goal from an early uh, stage of my academic career was to get a faculty position. And so for me, academic postdocs were at the top of the list and were always a goal. Um, so that's, that, that was my main consideration in, in trying to find a postdoc. And um, they also provide an opportunity um, to venture out into a different area of research and to gain new tools to explore my research questions. So that's why I chose to do a postdoc. Great, thank you, Samuel. Um, how about Kalidis? What, what um, were your considerations when you were thinking about whether or not to do a postdoc? So I think I have to ditto what someone said. I always knew I wanted to be an academician um, and doing a postdoc afforded the opportunity to gain additional expertise in the field, um, but also to decide, it was also a good opportunity to decide what kind of academician I wanted to be and where I wanted to be. So did I, I was at a research intensive institution doing my PhD and I always thought I wanted to go either back to Puerto Rico or be in a small minority serving institution. And so doing a postdoc kind of helped me make that decision um, and venture without really committing to a different place. Very good. Um, Alberto and Palo, do you have similar experiences or something different to add in terms of what you guys when we're considering? I'll say that even though when, since I was an undergraduate, I thought I was going to do grad school and then go do a postdoc. Since I had a, it was a difficult PhD experience and kind of extended, I did kind of change paths for a while. So I, uh, in between grad school and a postdoc, even though I was still considering applying for postdocs as I was finishing my PhD, I had a list of labs that I was interested in. I discussed it with my PI. And um, I took time, I took a year off in between finishing my PhD and starting a postdoc. I did an internship in science and technology policy in DC. And then I went to Puerto Rico and I, I was home for eight months, kind of recovering from grad school, thinking about what I wanted to do, um, taking sort of like a break from, from science and like being in a very intensive uh, track for a long time. But it, it, in a way, it like convinced me that I really wanted to do a postdoc. It gave me some kind of like a vision of what I wanted to get from my postdoc. And then I felt like I was much more ready to start my, start my position after that time off. And I started kind of like, I hit the ground running in the, in the postdoc and, um, and I was very happy with the decision of where I ended up going to. Good, that's, that's a... That's so it doesn't have to be a straight line. Yeah. That's a, that's a good point. And, and it's okay to explore other things as a PhD student. It's the right time and it's, you know, to, to consider if what's the right path to follow. Yeah, definitely. So you definitely had the opportunity to really think hard about it. Um, Alberto, what about you? Um, what, what went into that, that decision? I have similar experiences and I, I knew that I, that I liked the, the, the faculty route, and it was a way for me to e expand my tool set, learn new techniques. Uh, in this case, I was doing a lot of uh, circuit analysis uh, in vitro, and I wanted to take my work uh, to a, an in vivo model. So it was a way of expanding my, my tool set and learning new techniques, uh, new ways of doing science. And it, it was for me, the, the, a natural progression 
in, in continuing my work. So do you feel that um, you, want, you had decided you wanted to go into an area and you felt that you needed more training in order to be able to research in that area? Definitely, definitely. I, I wanted to, to learn new techniques and uh, new ways of doing science. So yeah, it was a, a way for me to, to keep learning. Uh, but, al but always within the goals and the interests that I had. So I wanted to learn more so I could like tackle different, the same question using uh, different techniques and, and looking at it in, in different ways. Okay. Um, for you guys, did you feel that you needed additional training in order to become more of an independent scientist? Is that, is that something that you were also uh, considering that uh, transition to independence? Um, did you see the postdoc as something that could help with that transition? I'll say that um, I chose purposely, I chose an area of research that overlapped slightly. So I, I'm in a psychiatric genetics. So it, it has something to do with neuroscience, but it's still very different from neuroscience. And so I have to actually, even though I didn't need training between grad school and my postdoc, I am undertaking a lot of training as a postdoc. So um, insofar as learning about uh, biostatistics and all, you know, all types of sequencing analysis um, in like a formal fashion, not only, you know, as, as I go analyzing it. And so, um, and I purposely chose a field that I think was growing and that, you know, that I, will give me a chance to grow as a, as a scientist uh, for my postdoc. So you're also taking courses in addition to the training that you receive in the lab doing the actual? Yeah. yeah. Okay. With the KO1, that's the whole point to also get train, formal training in, in genomics and uh, statistical biostatistics that I can actually analyze data without depending on analysts for this part of my research. Okay. Uh, Kaliri, Sam, um, Sam, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a significant value to those postdoc years, independent of how amazing our training was in graduate school. If you do want to be a faculty member and you want to have your own lab, there are significant managerial skills, working on a budget, writing grants, publishing papers, and actually having the intellectual capacity to publish these papers practically on your own. Um, there are so many different milestones that you gain, even if you do a short postdoc, um, that are very valuable. I mean, it really depends on your predoctoral training and how much flexibility and independence you had as a graduate student. Um, some of us ha did have a lot of room and applied for our own grants and did our own things, but others have a more structured graduate experience where your PI is like, okay, this is my specific aim one and two, that's your job, that's what you're doing, and that's it, and I have the money to pay for it, and you do it as fast as you can. Um, so it just really depends, and just having that time to do a postdoc kind of gives you the opportunity to grow as an intellectual, to put your name out there to connect with people and still have that PhD respect to like, yeah, I'm a doctor. <laughs> um, so I think it, it's a good stepping stone and it's a valuable time um, to take up that opportunity and to just get out there and, and, and feel confident to have your own independent program. Cause that's huge. Like, okay, now I can stand on my own two feet, have my own program, develop my own grants, develop, I, this is me. It, ha, it has no attachment to anybody else. And that's, that's really critical. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems we have a lot of questions that are starting to come up. Uh, Monica. Can I, can I jump in on the oh, last one? Yeah, sorry, there? Samuel. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so, the, so I think the, just dovetailing on what Kalidis just said, um, I think for me, the, the part of independence was really, really crucial because I was changing fields completely. And so basically I was in a position where I basically had to get some funding in order to make that transition. And so you, there are different types of postdocs and different routes you can take. And the route where, where, that I took was, was applying for fellowships uh, on my own, of course, in consultation with the mentors that I would work with. Um, and I think that was really valuable for me in the future because 
I got to write uh, experience in grant writing and and that's really part of how you start you know training yourself to put your ideas on paper and develop your own independent research line so was this something that um, you felt you had to do is go into a postdoc with with your own grant your own fellowship okay she cut out but um, I think I can answer um, I yeah so I think I think for me it would have it would have been hard to make that transition without having that funding um, so I think I think it was important and I think there are you don't necessarily have to do that that way. There are definitely other routes, but I think it's, if you're interested in the academic route, it definitely gives you a lot of advantages going forward. Okay, great. Uh, Monica, um, do you wanna call out the first question? Uh, yes. Um, so we have a few questions that have come from the chat. Um, I will start with a question from Carlos. Carlos, do you want to um, speak up and ask your question? After you took the break, that was a problem. I that came up when people were interviewing you? So, so let's see. Um, some so if they weren't like, they weren't close or anything, but you know, he knew who she was. So before he interviewed me, he called her and talked to her to get a feeling of like, why I took so long to finish my PhD and why I decided to take time off and what I was doing. And she was, she obviously gave a very good recommendation because then, you know, he hired me. Um, and some of the other people, some people asked me, some people didn't. And I mean, I just said that, you know, I, I had, you know, fellowships as a grad student. You know, when I was applying for postdocs, I was determined to get a postdoc. And um, I explained that I had done an internship and I was, I wanted to take my time to move on to the next step. And it didn't seem to affect me. And it didn't seem to affect me when I applied for, for the K01. I was worried that it was going to come up. I didn't, I didn't feel like I needed to provide an explanation or wasn't sure if I, I needed to, and it didn't come up in any of the reviews that I got for the, for the grant. So um, I don't think it's been an issue. Um, so. Great. Um, and if I may add to that, I know that I've heard from other people, if you, cause I mean, an eight month break is, you know, it's a, it's a chunk of time, but it's not that much. Um, and I've heard from other people that if you take a longer break, some people may question your commitment to research. Um, I don't know if any of you have had experience with that or that's something that I've heard from, from people as a concern and an experience that they've had. I, I, I'm in the process of hiring postdocs. And, you know, I, I think you need to have a very good explanation if you, if you take a six month break, if you, you know, so, so, you know, I think the, the devil is in the details, what happened during that break and, and all of this hiring is a very uh, personal process because it's, it's not the university that is hiring you, it's the PI from a lab. So there's this all mutual, mutual understanding. Uh, you know, you can talk to the person and every PI has a different style of running the lab. Uh, and, and some people are very understanding. They you know, say, look, I needed a break. I needed to do a few things. Uh, but you, you always want to look like you are accomplishing things and doing things. If I get a person and I don't know too much about that person, if I see a long break, uh, for me, that's a little discouraging. So I, 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 I might be hesitant to hire that person, but you know, about life, I think it's important. Self-reflection. 
and I would say the eight months was from when I went to Puerto Rico to when I started the postdoc. So I was obviously applying to, to postdocs. It hadn't been that long since I've been out. And I also, I said that I wanted to spend time with my family because in grad school, I really didn't get to go home to Puerto Rico very often. And I did, I applied for things from like, you know, two months after I got to Puerto Rico. And I ended up doing a, a course in developmental neurobiology in Okinawa, Japan during that time. So like I had the time to actually go to this course. And um, so I could put that in my CV too before I went to Japan. And as I was applying for the postdocs, meaning that I was obviously like still very much active in science. So. Yeah, I think the important thing is that you can show that you were productive during that time. And so if there's a record of productivity, the break doesn't really even have to come up. So I think just if you're engaged in science, if you're producing, that's what's important. You don't want to go away and have, you know, big gaps in your CV. And, and if you do, and there's a good reason for that, even in NIH, there's, there's mechanism to put that into your bio sketch so you can explain some of those gaps. But what's important is to remain productive and engaged in science. Yeah, I should add that there are also... Is, ...is critical, oh. and I want to ditto Alberto, even in this process of um, having your own lab and hiring people, it is very personal, and you are going to ask. You're going to ask the person's PI. You're going to ask, oh, do you know this person? You're going to check who they've published with and, you know, how long it's taken them to publish a paper or maybe several papers, depending on where they're at. It's, it's a very, you are committing to catapulting this person to the next step, whatever their next step is, because that po the postdoc is the bridge between you being a graduate student and you being whatever you're going to be, whether it be an industry or, or a professor or a researcher, whatever it's going to be. And you, it's a mutual understanding. And so that's a risk a PI takes with you as a trainee and vice versa, that's a risk that you take with committing to this other person. I remember through graduate school people saying, when you have an advisor, it's more difficult to separate those relationships than actually getting a divorce. So <laughs> the same type of commitment that you've made to your PI through graduate school, that's the same thing you wanna look for as a postdoc. And then in a postdoc, it's like this weird transition because you're like, wait a minute, I just finished my PhD, I have a doctorate, like I'm hot, stuff but now all of a sudden you also become the new kid on the block again and you have to re-establish yourself in this very different mic microcosm and these very different dynamic interactions that are in a lab and so how does that how do you fit in with them and how do they fit in with you so you have to keep that into account Awesome. Um, I see a couple of questions regarding length of postdoc. So instead of calling you out separately, because several of you have asked more than one question. So I'm going to combine those two questions. So there's been a couple of questions about how long your postdocs were and how important it is to do a short postdoc, maybe more than one short postdoc versus one um, long postdoc. Not depend on the field. Paola. Yeah, I think that depends on the field. Like what, what type of research you're doing, if it can actually like the stuff that most of the science that I work with, no one takes less than five or six years to do a postdoc. So um, like it's just not like you don't see anyone doing less than five or six years because between gathering data, analyzing data, publishing um, that's that's sort of like the norm, and that's what I when I went into the postdoc, I was pretty much thought it was going to be around five years. Um, but I think depend different disciplines in science definitely people do two three po year postdocs. If it's less like if there's no animal research or human research, it may also be shorter. So um, I the okay. average in my field is uh, six years. I did eight years as a postdoc. Uh, I did uh, uh, two, two postdocs of four years. And uh, I pretty much did it to, to learn more techniques and also to try another lab and see if uh, my publications could be in a higher tire uh, journal. That was uh, some of my, my ideas into going and doing a, actually a second postdoc. And I guess that it, it worked out in the end for me. I, I took a risk of doing a second postdoc and 
I learned new techniques, I met new people, and, and I got a chance to, to publish also uh, some papers. I think if you're also, if you're gonna do multiple postdocs that are short, then you have to take into account the time that it'll take you to apply for the next postdoc or to apply for funding. So basically getting out of a postdoc in a year is gonna be very difficult to do because you're midway, you're, you're just getting your feet wet at the six month mark and then you have to apply for something else. So, and I see Kalidis is laughing. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, so, so you have to have enough of a length there. And then I think, I think what Alberto did, I don't know why it's a risk in his field, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a good risk to take because you get more, more experiences. So if you can strike that balance of getting a, a, you know, a decent size length of time, but also have a couple of experience so you have more diversity in your experience, experimental tools, et cetera, I think that's, that's the way to go if you're interested in a research academic job. So my story is a little bit different. I actually, my postdoc officially lasted two years and I was able to publish and um, teach in those first two years. And then I was a research professor. I ended up, I was an internal hire. So I stayed within the institution that I was being paid at because I was actually collaborating with somebody and doing my work in another institution. But um but I think, like I said, it's fit is really important. And so I think that when I was looking for postdocs and the place where I wanted to be, I, I did my postdoc at an institution where I felt it, it was aligned with where I wanted to be in the future. So it just kind of, it was very mutualistic and synergistic in me deciding to stay there and my dean advocating for a position for me within that institution. And so um, it really depends ultimately on what your goal is. I know people that went to graduate school with me and decided not to do a postdoc and decided to go to, you know, to teach at a community college and have a faculty position there. Um, I know people that have done multiple postdocs. So ultimately you have to really self-assess what your goal is, where you want to be. Do you want to be in a research intensive institution? Do you want to be in a, a institution where you just want to teach? How much do you want to teach? How much do you want to get paid? How um, much of your salary do you want to be responsible for? So I'm in a medical institution, but I'm on hard money. So I get, I have an 11 month appointment. And so I don't have to worry about my salary, whereas other people in other medical institutions have to pay the majority of their salary. So it just really depends on what your ultimate goal is. And that's going to be one of the factors that you're going to keep into account in terms of where you want to postdoc, who you want to postdoc with, and what you want to do in the future. I have to add that uh, I think if you're worried about the how many postdoc years you want you know you're like willing to do you should really think about this i you know i i i i, I was a long time doing a postdoc and i loved it it was like the best experience ever it was a fun ride i i met the most amazing people so if you have like a still not really really sure if the postdoc is, is for you and thinking oh i only need to do a year i i think that's the wrong approach to look at this I think you just need to take the plunge and, you know, assume that this experience is probably going to be a, at least three years, which I think is in many fields is something reasonable, three years of postdocs. Um, so I don't know. I think, think about it like that. No, don't think about it all one more year. Even, even for industry, uh, for industry jobs, many jobs require a postdoc and at least in basic, uh, doing basic science in within neuroscience, I, I would say based on my experience, three years the, the least. Three years the least. Thank you. Um, we have, so I see, Gabriel, you have a question, or, or actually just yes, there a question, Omar. I see Veliz has a question. So Gabriel, let's go with you. Um, I mean, you had several questions. No, you don't want to ask questions. I can't hear you. <laughs> which, which question? I don't, I don't remember. I don't know which, which, so the, you had a question about um, when in during the postdoc 
did people feel prepared or if you want to ask another one of the questions that you had no that that's yeah yeah i can ask that one i remember okay, now go for it. so i wanted to ask at uh, the, the the ones that are faculty um when do you felt prepared to actually make that jump from from postdoc to faculty what was like you felt like okay i'm i think i'm ready enough like personally not academically in terms of uh, okay i have enough pub publication maybe i have funding i'm preparing more like a personal way that you felt like okay i'm 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 there Okay, so um, as a pre-doc, my, my, my doctoral advisor really pushed me to be an independent researcher. It, I was always fully funded on my own. I had my own grants. I had my own fellowships. I think she paid and she was, and you know, she did like six months of my stipend. Um, so I, it took me six and a half years to finish my PhD. Um, and so when I came into my postdoc, I had already developed a lot of independent thoughts. So even at the postdoc, even with my postdoc, when I came into the lab, I was like, this is what I want to do. Da -da 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 -da. And I kind of just broke it down <laughs> to my, um, I, my advisor mm -hmm. and it was like a natural progression. So I was really determined that I was going to study how drugs affected the developing brain. And I had all these ideas. And so I was at a place that supported my ideas and I was able to kind of negotiate what I wanted really early on. And so I think it was luck. Um, at the same time, I felt like I had really solid um, training as a pre-doc that kind of facilitated that process to occur. Does that happen all the time? No. So, um, you know, I know somebody that, those of you that are in neuroscience may know, Scott Russo, who works in, with Nestler, and he's a, an assistant professor right now at Mount Sinai. Scott came to the CUNY system and he got his PhD in four years, and he really felt like he had zero training. So he did an eight year postdoc with Nestler and Nestler brought him over to Mount Sinai. And so it's just very dependent and you will know the moment that you're like, hmm, I really don't like speaking with this person about my science anymore. And you like, you're, you have these growing pains where you're like, oh my gosh, I really need to move forward. You will know, your gut will tell you, your heart will tell you, your intellectual capability will tell you that it's time to move forward. And you will also be at a level in your profession where you're going to say, okay, I need another postdoc to tweak this and to solidify what I want to do moving forward. Or I have my three aims for my first R01 and I can make this happen. So I think it's really important that you have a story that you want to follow and you have ideas already developed to move forward into your independent position. With that, I'll give it to our big um, When I, I, I was kind of pushed into this situation, uh, three months after I arrived to my lab in San Diego, uh, my PI decided to take a position in Switzerland. Uh, so, we basically, he had like a joint position between the university and this company, and we were running the lab uh, between four postdocs at the time. And for three, re for three years, we, we ran the, the lab like this, uh, between the four postdocs, we will do all the hiring, uh, we will look at the budget, order animals. So I was pushed into this situation where I had to do a lot of this stuff, uh, behind the science, all the administrative stuff, and, and it really prepared me. And, you know, I, I got into this situation, and at, at first I thought it was going to be terrible uh, because I just wanted to focus on my science, but uh, it was actually the, one of the best experiences that could have ever happened to me. Uh, he was always a great mentor. Like, we will meet over, in, over Skype regularly, but we really had to run the machine and take care of the little details. And I think everybody gets to that point uh, naturally. At some point, you're going to see, look, you're, you're, you have like three undergrads under your supervision. You have to tell them what to do. 
So you, you, you get into that and either you feel it and you say, oh, you know, I can do this. I can do the same thing I, my PI is doing. I can write animal protocols. I can help write, I can write the grants. I can organize the lab. So you see it and, oh, I can do this. And you become really independent and then you decide, okay, this is, this is for me. And, but I was pretty much pushed into that situation very early on. Thanks. Awesome, Samuel or Paula, do you want to add anything to anything? Or you're kind of making that transition now? Well, I will say that it, I think you will have, well, right now I just, I have four years of funding, so I kind of ha can make my decision sometime in, that, in, the, in, in those four years. But we have two, someone asked about staying in the same institution, and I wanted to kind of, for proposal to faculty, um, I mean, Calidis is talking about it, but I want to give the perspective from two people in my lab who had both had KO1s as postdocs in this lab. They both got R01s while they were on the KO1s. So obviously the department's like, sure, you can stay here. Like, you know, you have your own money. Um, and one of them just got their second R01, you know, within like a year after the first R01. But my lab is also involved in many international collaborations. And that's a very different from my PhD lab, which was very insular, even though it had, it had a lot of money, but it was still insular. My PI is part of a, a big consortia, and that, that's also been a, a nice kind of like a, a nice, I guess, pro of being in this lab. And I, you know, a big change from grad school. So he has collaborations. He's half appointed at UNC, half in Sweden. So there's like collaborations all over Europe. And, um, and that's been fruitful for people in the lab and also for, I think, uh, thinking of something like that for um, a postdoc where you have opportunities to do research elsewhere, it's, uh, it's worthwhile considering. Wonderful. Um, Omar, you had a question about the essential traits of a PhD student. Do you wanna go ahead and ask that question? Yeah, of course. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. Um, yes, I want, I know there is a difference between postdocs in academia and industry. I just wanted to know what, um, what specific traits are important uh, in both scenarios and what is the difference of doing a postdoc in, uh, in academia versus industry? I, I can add a few things. Uh, you know, I, I think the... I've seen, a, I've seen some people do the postdoc in, uh, in industry, and usually their route is to stay in industry. Once you take that route, it's, uh, it's harder to come back to academia. Uh, but I think it's a decision that people take. They, they just take and decide, yeah, I, I, on the long term, I want to work in industry, so I'll, I'll do that transition. I, I think you ask about traits that you need for for the postdoc specifically? Yes, uh, for, for to being successful. I know there, you mentioned independence, also productivity. Um, but uh, for example, industry can be sometimes more, uh, let's say, structuring some things than uh, that academia is not as well uh, as important in academia, let's say that. But um, I, I, I think uh, one thing is the personality. Do you do you see yourself in this structured environment working, uh, or or you are more of you, or you're more on, in this unstructured environment where you pretty much set your own rules and you you can be highly independent. So it is also you need free thinkers in uh, in in industry and you know sometimes you have to solve problems and and now there's different companies that there you know this this thing that there's like this big uh, structured company where you do one job is not true anymore uh, there's many uh, startups for example in boston where they need people that can solve problems look at problems in different ways and apply their their techniques or their 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 their, uh, their knowledge to solve a problem. So there's different types of industry jobs, and some of them are less structured and they look more like startups. And and others, you you go in into a project and you do one job. So you, within industry, you can actually look and 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 
and see what kind of jobs you prefer or where do you fit in? Did I, I answer everything, Omar? Yes, yes, you did. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, good. Thank you. Um, one thing, no, I think one thing, one thing, project management, it's one thing that I think they'll maybe ability to, uh, to mentor people and to manage, manage projects and people is something that probably is very, it's important for academia, but it's very valued in, in industry. Um, and like organizational skills, which, uh, so that you can run projects, be able to manage deadlines. But I think it's, they overlap a lot, academia and, and industry and like the, the needs, if you're doing science, th there's things that are, that you, skills that you need to have that are going to be overlapping. Yeah, I want to, I want to second that. I've heard from, from people who work in, in big biotech companies like Genentech or stuff like that when when you come on they are evaluating you as a scholar and as a researcher so they're going to use a lot of the same metrics that research universities use so they're going to look if you're productive um, if you have leadership if you um, you know have made original contributions so i think especially if you're looking to be in a leadership role um, in a biotech company that's that's uh, going to be important If I can jump in, um, I think one, one question I think would be interesting to hear from the how are you look for that post -op? first one, um, old contact. You're cutting out. Okay. I can ask the question if you want. So um, she's, she wrote it in the chat. Um, so she wanted, Giovanna wanted to bring the question about how you started to look for your postdocs. Did you get a cold call from somebody that said, I want you to recruit you to my lab? Um, did you network with somebody at a conference? Was it somebody that you knew through PIs or mentors or, or people in your network? How did you approach the, pro the process of, of, of searching, searching, finding the postdoc? Could I take that one? Yes. Yeah, so I, I, it particularly in, I think there are a lot of different types of postdocs, even within academia. So you can get uh, fellowships that you apply for. And so it's very much like applying for an NSF pre-doc where you're writing a proposal and finding someone to do that work with. And so that's, you can do that with both, you know, NSF or NIH. And there are similar programs at universities as well. Um, and then I think the other big category of postdocs in academia are ones where you are basically hired onto a grant to do some work. And so for those, I think what's critical is knowing a lot of people um, because there's, you know, there's a lot of PhD applicants that are looking for postdocs. And so it really helps if you have a personal connection with a person and they know your work to go into that. And then there are other postdocs, of course, in industry. There are postdocs in, non, in the nonprofit world that I've heard of uh, with, you know, the Audubon Society or, you know, the Nature Conservancy. So, so it really depends on, there are all these big categories and you need to figure out which one is best for you right now and for your career goals, especially. I will say that um, so think like, like what Samuel said, um, I, my strategy was that I emailed people and I mentioned the subject line, what lab I was from, from, for, cause I was for the labs that it, they were in the field that I was in. So they would know who my PI was so that I would, they would at least open the email. Um, cause my PhD advisor, she was not going to email anyone on my behalf. I mean, she would write a letter and if they called her, she would talk to them, but she wasn't going to uh, be like proactive. Um, but the person that I ended up for my postdoc, he knew her, so he did call her and get her feedback. And I did get, Eric Nestler was one lab that I applied to and he replied to my email because he knew her. So um, I think definitely having either a personal connection or that they know what lab you're coming from, uh, 
definitely helps because otherwise it's going to go into their junk mail or just going to delete the email if you're applying via email versus, you know, there's other mechanisms, but for if you're going to a grant, that's the most likely mechanism. So I, during my pre-doctoral training, I was told you have, you should start looking for postdocs at least two years before you're done. How realistic that is. Um, so one, you can have a really open conversation with your PI because your PI knows people, right? And so my PI did not take that approach with me. However, yes, honey. Sorry, my son is, is coming to bed too. Um, so he, my PI never took that approach, but I will say that I have taken that approach with my, honey, it can't be too loud. I've taken that approach um, with my students. So I will choose, I will, I will connect people, connect my students, to, I'm so sorry, connect my students to other PIs as they're transitioning. Um, another thing to look for are institutions that have training grants, T32s for postdocs. And so you know that the government is giving this institution money to train postdocs to transition into independent positions. So that's always a place that, will, that should be providing the appropriate training for their postdocs to be able to transition. Approaching people the best way is this is what, I, just like if you were applying for a job, the same structure that a cover letter would have. I heard you're looking for a postdoc. Um, these are my skills. I think this is what you might be looking for. Here's what I can bring in. Networking at conferences is critical. That's what I do to look for postdocs. I go to a conference. I try to see who's working with who. I walk around the posters. If the person sounds interesting and when they're telling me about their study, they're really excited hey, I have a postdoc position. Let's talk about this a little bit further. And so you have to use that opportunity for that FaceTime and just making yourself visible or you go visit their poster and also ask about that. When I first started looking for postdocs, most of my, because I came from a research intensive institution, I looked for those positions at research intensive institutions and you have to speak to the people in the lab and make those observations because that is critical to your survival in that environment. <laughs> so take the time to do it, but typically it doesn't come together until you have your defense state <laughs> and know when you can start. I wanted to add something that Galiri said, which is, which is, uh, she talked about, you know, looking for, as a professor, looking for postdocs, um, and so a lot of times, and this is something that I think is really important, a lot of time, a lot of postdocs aren't even advertised. Or when they're advertised, people already have, PIs already have someone in mind for it. So I think perhaps a better approach is to decide what direction do you want to go? Who would you want to work with? And then figure out, okay, how are we going to make this work? Uh, am I, do they have money? Are they looking for someone? Sometimes you don't know. Sometimes they are looking for someone and or can I write a fellowship to work with them? So just bear that in mind that a lot of times when that ad comes out, it's it's already in some cases too late. Alberto, do you want to add anything to that? I, 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 I agree with, with Samuel. Uh, I, I think you first need to ask yourself, what are your interests? Where do you want to go? And, and as everybody said in the panel, uh, networking is a, is a big component of this. You need to, the best way to meet people is to present your data, go to a meeting, have a, either a poster or some kind of oral presentation. And when you do that, things just start like, you know, you, people just come to your poster, introduce themselves to you, and, and things happen, you know, you, you get a lot of interaction with people. Uh, that said, uh, you can always uh, email labs and, and, and see what's going on if, they, if they're looking for postdocs, but this, uh, the cover letter, at least in my opinion, is very important. I, I get emails from postdocs every day, and, you know, I, I open the cover letter and read it. Uh, even if you 
are a microbiologist and you want to work in my lab, if you have a good cover letter and a good reason to work in my lab, uh, you know, it might work out, it might work for the for both of us. So I think what you say in the cover letter, your reasons for joining that lab, what could you bring to the table, what do you want to learn is, is, is also very important when you're uh, looking for a postdoc. So this actually brings us into a question that is uh, it's being uh, voted up on the chat. Um, so Gabriel, do you want to go ahead and, and ask the question about transitioning? Stop making faces and ask the question. <laughs> You're muted. Sorry. Um, so uh, let me see if I can see the question, if I can remember. Um, so do you, do you suggest to stay in the same field of research for the postdoc position? I've heard um, uh, contradictory you know, responses to this. Some people say, yeah, it looks good sort of moving out, branching out of your uh, field of research when, you, when you're doing your, your pre-doc and then doing a little bit something different as your post-doc. Some people say, well, I mean, sometimes you can go to a bigger lab, more um, uh, productive lab uh, in the same field and you can publish more that way. Um, so what is your take on this or what do you think? Right. Well, I think you probably I'll take, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, you made the biggest transition. So, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't think, uh, it, it really depends here how you define field and whatnot. I don't think there are a lot of people that would support the notion of doing exactly the same thing that you did in your PhD for your postdoc. So that's sort of square one. You always want to do something different because so much of your PhD is, is, you know, you're training, you're forming yourself as a scientist. And so you, you want to go beyond that and try to figure out what you want to do. And so you can stay in the same field. And again, it depends on how, how you define this, how, how you define field. Um, but you can go and get new techniques. Uh, go, like you said, go to a bigger lab that has, you know, more resources. And that's totally valid. Um, my case, I think, was a little bit extreme, especially seems extreme on the surface, but I'm, I'm asking a lot of the same questions. I just changed the biological system very dramatically. Um, but I think it's important um, to, to have your goals in mind and, and have a narrative of how this is all fitting, fitting together. I mean, I think you need to be strategic about it and figure out how it fits into your long-term career goals. Okay. I think that's one of the signs of knowing that you're ready to move on, right? So you ask yourself, what do I want to do when I grow up? What question? Because it's literally like, what question? What are you going to research? What is your contribution to science for the rest of your life? And what do you need to accomplish that? And the postdoc is going to be what's going to catapult you to finding the answers to those questions. And so if it's a new technique under the same question, then you go in that direction. If it's, I've been studying, you know, aplesia for all these years and I want to move into a human lab. Well, you know, that's what you do. So you have to like really soul search and say, what is it? What it, what empire, what's my empire going to be? What's my contribution going to be? And then with that, decide what direction you want to take. And of course, you want to talk to your mentors about this because they know you and they know what you've been thinking about and they've been having these conversations with you. And you're going to use that to make those decisions. And they may suggest names or you may be the one that's doing the legwork. But you really want to think about what do I want to do when I grow up? I'll, I'll add that. So I was in a PhD lab that did a lot of, of different types of research, neurodevelopmental uh, brain stuff, uh, psychiatric disorders, the neurodegeneration. And I, want, I knew I wanted to go into the neurodevelopmental part of it. Um, and, but I didn't want to stay doing the same type of experiment that I did in grad school. I did mice uh, again. And so I, I wanted to learn about genomics. So it's still in the same organ, but still very different type of questions and tools. And um, it, 
it looks it's still very different like especially the first three years i've been doing like se rna sequencing of mouse brains and a very different research question than my, my phd but then you want to grow during your postdoc and i think there's there's different ways to grow but i, I really wanted to learn new techniques and um to tackle a, a problem that i had kind of been exposed to since my P my time in my phd lab okay I, I can add a little bit uh, to this theme. Um, when I did my first postdoc, um, I looked, I learned a new technique. So in vivo to photon imaging, uh, there, at the time there were only a few labs doing this technique. So I chose one lab that was at UCLA where I did my PhD. Uh, I got some good papers out, I learned the technique, but then once I understood more about the technique, I, I understood that I was limited in what I could learn about uh, plasticity in cortical circuits. And that was one of the reasons why I decided to do the second postdoc, where I learned I, uh, also uh, in vivo imaging, but it was more uh, functional imaging. So I was looking at the activity of neurons using genetically encoded uh, calcium sensors. So I needed to make that transition in order to kind of like a tackled uh, the same question using a different technique that could give me more answers. And that was one of the reasons for me to move on to this second postdoc, uh, because I felt I was limited in what I could do. Okay. Thanks. Okay, um, I wanted to kind of shift gears um, a little bit and I wanted to see what thoughts or, or comments you had um, in terms of, well, there's, there's two parts to this question. First of all, there's some people in, in psychology and behavioral sciences um, between the fellows and I know that, you know, doing a postdoc is field dependent. So I was wondering if any of the panelists have comment in fields that are more in psychology and focused on behavioral sciences, are there differences in terms of like, do you have to do a postdoc if you wanna go into academia or postdoc shorter? Um, so, you know, if you can comment on that. Sure, so I'm in a medical school and in addition, I'm in training programs that train clinical psychologists and they still do postdocs. <laughs> um, for the most part, they could be titled internships. They're a little bit shorter. Um, if you want to remain in academia as part of your postdoc, what you do want to make sure that you do is have some sort of teaching experience. Um, at this point, most faculty positions, unless they're research professor positions, want you to have some sort of teaching experience and want you to have some sort of like role and mentoring and guiding students. Um, so they do do postdocs. They're mostly, um, they're a little bit shorter and they're mostly through training programs where you do more clinical research. So with clients or patients, however you want to um, capture that. A lot of them are also postdocs in teams. So you'll be working with other, with other clinicians like physicians um, or other clinical scientists. Um, and so once again, it's dependent on where you want to end up in terms of the length of the postdoc and if you want to do several postdocs, but yes, they are, they are being recommended to transition into the academia. And most uh, postdocs, uh, most faculty positions involved in basic science, you probably require some degree of postdoc. But, uh, and I, I think it also has to do with the level of maturity and experience. And I think that this might apply also to psychology. Uh, when you're a PI, you, don't, you no longer do so many experiments. And there's a new, there, there's a new skill that is required to, to make your lab uh, move forward and it's actually a psychological skills, how to interact with people, uh, how to make people do what you want to do and you know, not fight with them. So there are, other, there are all these other skills that you gain with maturity and experience and you know, you need, you, I hope you can learn to, you know, with these years to also deal with people. You know, you're not gonna get along with everybody in the lab 
uh, there's going to be problems, but you always have to be diplomatic about this situation. Uh, how you can move a project forward if you don't like somebody. And these are things that I think you learn by just being in the lab and interacting with people. So uh, I think some uh, positions, faculty positions that are more teaching uh, centered don't require the, the, this postdoctoral Trans, the, the, the postdoctoral position, but uh, even in psychology, I, I think it, it, it would be really hard to to have, you know, to get a position just with very little experience coming out from a PhD because, because of this psychological ex experience component of dealing with people. Yeah. Absolutely. And even with research extensive institutions, um, the only people that I've seen obtain faculty positions in those types of institutions are people that have been incredibly productive during their pre-doctoral years and that have had some sort of teaching experience as pre-docs. So, you know, right now, PhDs, there's just a lot of people out there that have these great skill set. Like, how often are you going to come by somebody like Alberto who has eight years of experience and, and as a postdoc and almost ran a lab for four years and so if he were applying for a position he's going to compete against somebody that may have had this great pre-doc experience two years of a postdoc and decided oh yeah i'm ready it's right now you have to hone in on all of these different skills and be multi-dimensional and have to have some sort of you know a little bit i'm not saying oh during your six-year postdoc you need to hold you know, three adjunct faculty positions. And I will say that during my three year postdoc, I had two adjunct faculty positions. <laughs> um, but you have to have a little bit of everything and think of being a very multifaceted person when it comes to being an academician at any institution nowadays. Both of my parents have PhDs. And when I would talk to them about what I had to do in graduate school and what I had to do as a postdoc, to be qualified for a faculty position, they were like, are you crazy? Like, what are you doing? You had to put together these undergrads and you had to help this other person do this. And a long time ago, as long as you did your experiments, you were straight. But nowadays, that's just not how it is. And people are looking for you to have an array of techniques that stem from the people skills, the social skills, to the very high level intellectual skills because we have access to all of this information. And so that's something that you have to be very mindful about in this process. One thing I was gonna say um, is that in my PhD, I had to be like completely independent and I had to take care of everything. So I had to do from breeding the mice and doing, slicing their brains, staining, imaging, Western bloods, managing the colony. I had to train undergrads every summer plus during the semester. I had to apply for fellowships and I had my own funding during my PhD. So I came to, to my postdoc pretty much fully independent and my PI pretty much is, he's very involved, but at the same time, very hands off. And so I've, got, I've had, gotten a chance to run like many, I think I'm involved in like five different projects with collaborators in uh, the Netherlands and in like Massachusetts and here at UNC and at Duke and um, you know and we it's 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 sort of like I'm not running the lab but I, I am in charge of uh, making sure that like we do follow up with our collaborators that I'm staying on task with uh, with the projects that um, you know that we spend money in like a uh, you know, we're not like throwing money away, um, you know, manage the time of the technician and like cell culture technician. Um, and so I hope, hopefully that this will prepare me for the next step. Um, but I think looking for opportunities like that, you know, getting a sense that uh, the places that you apply for, for your postdoc, that you will have independence as a postdoc, that you won't have to box yourself to one question and that you're not competing against other people and that you won't have an opportunity for growth is very important to keep in mind when you're uh, looking into different labs. Thank you for that. Um, Yanima, you had a question about teaching and there's actually been several questions about teaching. So you, do you wanna go ahead and, and ask your question? Sure, I, just, I was wondering how much is an appropriate amount of teaching experience 
uh, would you say like three, four glasses or I don't know how many glasses per se or if it's, you know, if it's like years or different skills or different classes that you need to teach in specific? So what, what do you think? Um, anyone can answer. So for teaching, it, again, it depends on what you, where you want to end up. Um, for a postdoc, you don't need teaching experience. Um, for a postdoc, you're building your portfolio in terms of research and becoming an independent researcher. The goal of the postdoc is to, again, take you to a place where you are prepared to have a faculty position. And so if you want to be in an institution where you're going to teach, you have to have some sort of teaching experience. I think, um, for example, those of, of us that went to graduate school in Puerto Rico, a lot of us in Puerto Rico have, you know, a lot of our stipend comes from doing teaching, <laughs> TAing for all of these different courses. In the States, the programs are not necessarily like that. And so a lot of students pre that are in pre-doctoral programs don't have to teach or have some very minute role as a TA in some sort of graduate course. So they're not active teachers and they don't have the skills on how to prepare a syllabus, how to deliver a lecture. Um, now there are all these new things about flipped classroom and creating an active learning environment. And so there are all of these things in education and pedagogy that we are not taught as scientists, and much less in a lab, um, that we will have to do as academicians. Again, if you are going into an institution that will require you to teach. So those are things that you have to research. Like again, what, what is your ultimate goal? What type of institution do you wanna be at? And what are you comfortable in teaching? As part of that transition from postdoc to faculty, one of the questions will be, what are you comfortable teaching? What would you like to teach? There are some institutions that are actually going to ask you to deliver a lecture for a class. And so you want to have some sort of teaching experience. Hopefully as a postdoc, you're, if you're in an institution that can provide you with those opportunities, you'll start guest lecturing in some classes. And then you might be able to apply for adjunct positions if you're in a big city and you have access to community colleges or to smaller schools, you can have an adjunct position and teach a class and kind of learn in that way. Like I said, during my postdoc, I was a postdoc um, at City College and that was part of the CUNY system. I had my adjunct position at Hunter, which I've had since 2009. And I was also an adjunct for um, Yeshiva University. And so I, was, I knew I wanted to be in a teaching institution that I wanted to have that access. And so as a postdoc, I made sure that I was teaching somewhere. So some experience is okay, and it will depend on what type of institution you want to end up at. But to transition as a pre-doc to a post-doc, you don't need teaching experience. Thank you. Uh, I can add, uh, my current position requires uh, that, I, that I teach. I have to teach one class per semester. I had zero experience, which was, <laughs> they just give you a book and they send you to the class. And uh, so I learned it on the, on the go. Uh, that said, a, I had a few friends over the years that knew that they really wanted to teach like more of a, a, an institution that was more centered on teaching and they, they didn't want to be in a, a research institution. So they somewhere along along their careers they started doing for example one of them started doing a part-time job with a community college and she did a little bit of classes uh, when she was finishing up her phd and then when she finished her phd she had that transition she had that experience that teaching experience and she actually got a job at that same institution where she started uh, where she did the part-time job so the uh, uh, as she was saying that the postdoc doesn't really prepare you for teaching it's not the it's not the goal of the postdoc but i, I think it's something that you actively have to look at as, as, as my friend did she she looked for this institution she worked part-time so that meant more work for her because she had to do research but also prepare for classes i also at night but I, you know, if this is what you want to do, uh, then 
you ha you have to get the preparation somehow because you you uh, you uh, a research postdoc is gonna be competing with other people that are that actually have taken classes and have taught a lot. So if you have to make that transition into this teaching position, you have to make sure that you are ready for it and that you have put some some hours into it. And I mentioned in the chat that there's the IRACTA program, and here at UNC they have the Spires Fellows program, which is very successful, and people have, uh, they spend, I think, the first year or two just doing research, and then they do teaching and research at the same time. And people follow different paths. Some people decide that they want to stay in research, and some people decide that they want to do mostly teaching, and some people do half and half. And I think uh, it depends on sort of like what your goals are, what type of research you do, can it, um, is it conducive to do this type of research at a teaching intensive institution? Um, and uh, also, kind of, you know, what type of, how successful you are in your postdoc on the research side of things. Uh, but I know people that have kind of followed the three paths here at UNC, um, and they've done well, I think, in the tracks that they've chosen. Yeah, I just wrote in the chat that it's like you have to do some soul searching. <laughs> different institutions are going to have different expectations and different requirements of you. And so when making this transition to a postdoc, having a structured program is great because most of the time they're structured, they have a finite time, that you are you have courses or different workshops that you're doing and then at the same time you're getting training and other things. So finding these places that have ARACTA, that have NSF Advance, that have Spires, that all these different programs are a great opportunity to kind of be immersed in all of the different skills that you need to have in order to be an academic and set you up for specific institutions. And so if you know that, by all means, like these, those are great things to do. So there have been a great couple of questions that I think are very, very important. Um, I know that we may have a few people that are actively looking for postdocs. Um, and so one question for all of the panelists is, relatively quickly because we don't have a lot of time left. Um, what advice would you provide um, for people that are interviewing? Like what kind of questions you should ask um, when you're interviewing for your postdoc about access to resources or what kind of funding would be supporting you? So just kind of, you know, if you have key questions that you think people should ask when they're interviewing for, for postdocs to help them make the decision or where to go. I, I can add a few things. Uh, always uh, go to the actual institution physically and interview there. Never take a position that you just interview over Skype. Uh, this should be common sense. You should go give a presentation. And then, very importantly, you should have lunch with grad students and postdocs. This is very important. And you, you ask a lot of questions there. Go, go to lunch with them. Do they like the lab? Uh, you can ask very detailed questions and, and people usually are pretty honest. Or if they don't say anything, you can sense that uh, nervousness or anxiety. Um, you should also uh, look at where the postdocs that have been there and the grad students are right now. Are they successful? Have they gotten uh, jobs after uh, joining that lab? Um, some PIs, you know, just care about their science and they don't really care in the end about the person specifically or where it ends up. So it's up to you to do some research and see if the PI actually helps, you know, the, the, the people in the lab get jobs, whatever their goal is, right? Uh, and also, a, very briefly, just talk to the PI and see if you can develop a, a research program that allows you to apply to fellowships so that you can be independent. And uh, I, I think this is very important. If, he, if he's willing, he or she is willing to, to work with you to develop that research a program and develop a project and aims, then that, that sounds like a, like a good sign. 
I wrote I wrote a bunch of things that came to my mind. Um, again, I had a challenging PhD, I will say this, and I was very prepared of like, I wanted to avoid the same experience and I wanted it to be a very positive experience. And that if I would wanted to stay in academia, like I didn't want to make the decision just based on my PhD. I wanted to be like, okay, I want to have a good postdoc. And then if I decide to stay in academia, like to make the decision based on that. So um, I interviewed by Skype. I gave my talk via Skype. I got an offer by phone, a phone call and I decided to visit before I made my decision. Um, and I'm, you know, I definitely wanted to meet the people in person. So I talked to the postdocs, the technicians, my advisor doesn't have grad students. He's he had one grad student. It was an awful experience and he just decided he never want to wants to have grad students, but he's a very good mentor, but he, he rather have just postdocs in the lab. Uh, so I would ask about um, expectations from the PI to as, well, for you as a postdoc. Um, if there's expectations to have your, your own funding, uh, about his, their mentoring style, um, about how, how good they are, about people moving on, do you get to take your projects? Are they uh, protective of the research in the lab? How much freedom do you get as a postdoc? Um, do, is there opportunity for growth and to explore different avenues of research beyond the main questions that the lab has? Uh, what are your responsibilities beyond your day-to-day -day research, research activities insofar as, far as mentoring um, and other lab, you know, lab activities? Time commitment. Is there an expectation for you to be a certain number of hours in the lab? I didn't want to be in a lab that expected me to be here for 100 hours a week. So I wanted to know what was my PI schedule like? How much time did the postdoc spend in the lab? Do they have to, did they have to work on weekends? Could they take time off? Uh, when you know they needed to take vacation, um, and how invested was the uh, was you know the advisor on the trainees on their success? How much effort did he put on on their development, uh, and how often did they did he meet with them? And you know how fruitful were these meetings, um, you know, for their advancement? And so I wrote those down just now. Um, and I you know you want to make sure that you're in an environment that you can be successful and happy. And in a city also, a place that you will like. So visit the place to know if it's a good fit, personal fit, institution-wise, and also the, the community around it. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna share a story. <laughs> when I was transitioning, I did my homework. I spent two, year, two years before, like I said, and I looked for uh, all this, these people and had connections and, I met this woman who will remain nameless, um, who was very prominent in the field, had a great reputation, was, was where I wanted to be, um, and did the research that I wanted to do for the rest of my life when I grew up. And we met at a conference, and we had great rapport, and it was fantastic. And she was very interested. She called um, my graduate advisor and was like, I, I want her. What does she need to do in order to finish? I will help. I will do whatever I need to do. So I was like, this is fantastic. So I came. I visited the lab. And I was very excited. She was a woman of color. I was like, I'm going to grow as a person and as a scientist, and this is going to be incredible. And I visited the lab, and it was a huge lab with lots of people. And then I started hearing the gossip and um, how she had fired two people already at different levels, that she thought one of her postdocs was crazy. Then um, while I was in the lab, I was just having a snack in a back room and her MD-PhD student who was at the graduate level at that time and one of her postdocs, um, who was a very soft-spoken Asian woman, much older, they were having a fight over drug concentrations and she did nothing about it. She just kind of entertained the interaction. And I was like, this is crazy. And as and I gave a talk and they were like, you're amazing. You're going to fit in just perfectly. And I was just really torn. And on my way, when we left the lab, we were talking and she was like, you know, some people just have an off day. And my gut was like, run, run. Do not talk to this person ever again. This is not where you need to be. And I made the mistake that I accepted the offer. 
and I came and three months in, I was like, you people are nuts. Um, and I resigned from my first postdoc position in, in three months. I was like, no way. The lab was super clicky. There was lots of gossip and people pointing fingers and people would take mistakes and not take ownership. And it was just not where I wanted to be in terms of a social <laughs> interaction. And I, I, that was when I really was like, what is going on with these people? Like, who does this? The other two postdoc offers that I had were from two very prominent scientists, also research intensive institutions. One of the males was known for stalking his postdocs and being inappropriate. The other one was a very prominent woman who was known for keeping her people. She trained you, she made you fantastic, and she kept you. And she made sure you stayed and worked for her. So you really want to they can throw money at you. They can do a whole bunch of things, but you really want to be there to assess what the dynamics are. And you want to ask the questions that nobody wants to talk about because it is your sanity and it is your career. And you are co-signing with this person for the rest of your life. So with that being said, always follow your gut. That, yes. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that story, Kaliris. Um, I think that's, really important. I mean, I, I, I know that I've heard other, other similar stories from, from people that I know. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so we have five minutes left and there were a couple of questions that were great. And unfortunately we're not going to have time to, to ask on air, but you can always follow up with, with the panelists, but I want to close with, and in the interest of time, I'm just going to ask it myself. So this question came from Carlos um, and his question is what is the hardest thing you had to do when you started your postdoc that you wish you had learned during their PhD training um, and the reason you know we want to end with that is because most of the fellows are in the middle of their training so if they can start practicing or learning from from that experience so yeah um, go for it and keep it brief because we just have five minutes <laughs> I want to go. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer that question by not answering it because I think we focused a lot on the challenges of being a postdoc, the strategy, and all that. And, and what I want to leave you with is that being a postdoc, at least at the route that I've taken, is one of the most joyous you know, phases of any academic career. And you talk to a lot of people who have gone through it, and they will say the same thing because it is a different thing from grad school. Now you don't have this, you know, looming deadline, you don't have of the PhD, you don't have to teach in many cases, and you're going to be more focused on what your work is going to be going forward. And this applies to, to a industry position or, or teaching focused po postdoc. So it can be really, really liberating. And I just want to leave you with, with that thought that if you know where you're going and you need a postdoc to get there, that it is likely going to be one of the most rewarding stages in your career. So don't worry too much about the challenges. But good question. For me, it's stay humble and remember why you're in this, which is to make a significant contribution to science. And that means that you're a lifelong learner. So Yes, you have a PhD and people call you doctor now, but that doesn't really mean much. <laughs> You're still learning and training and becoming better. So I think it's not, what did you learn? What do you need to learn before you finish grad school? It's always remembering that we're learners and we're still taking a lot of information in and building. Um. I'll add to this, uh, focus on the science always. The, the science always comes first. You know, make sure your science is working. If it's not working, make sure it works somehow. And I, I think if you love what you're doing, everything else uh, should work. So that's it. And focus on the science. I would say uh, find a, 
it's good to have, you, you need either a really good PhD mentor or a really good postdoc mentor. So make sure that you get that because you're going to need people to connect you and take you to the next level, write you letters of recommendation, write, you know, help you with in the future with like tenure letters, et cetera. Um, and so make sure that you have like a good support network and it doesn't have to only be your advisor. You know, you can have other mentors, but it's, for me, finding a really good mentor for my postdoc that's given me a lot of different opportunities to grow and, uh, and showing me kind of like new, giving me a lot of freedom to follow, you know, research questions that the lab had never worked on before has been key to making me feel like, like I fit in and that like I'm meant to be here and not, you know, give up on science and, and do something else. Great. Um, so with that, we'll actually end the conversation. Thank you, thank you so much, everybody, for your great advice, for, for providing real talk, um, for really being honest with, with your answers. Um, and yeah, thank you, all of your, your fellows, for your questions, amazing questions. Um, so again, this was recorded. We'll be posting it online with a blog post. Um, so if anybody has resources that they want to share, um, you can post them on the chat or you can actually send them to, to myself or Giovanna and we'll make sure to include those additional resources on the blog post um, for the benefit of the fellows and the whole wide world. Um, so thank you again for, for this amazing conversation and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye, everybody. You. Bye. Bye. Thanks.